Um, what we're learning today is really, really cool. It's a really neat little uh, algorithm for a few reasons. It's super powerful. It's super useful. Okay. Uh, we, we've done all of this factoring, which is just a skill. We have no context for why you would ever do it other than in a math class when you're asked to factor. Right? We haven't looked at that yet. This you'll understand a little bit better why we use it, but in the next unit, we're learning all these skills right now. In the next unit, we're going to apply all these skills to solving some real world kind of problems, okay? Um, which is real stuff. Like it's like, yeah, they're math class questions, but it's real stuff. So it's good stuff. Uh, and like I said, this is a powerful, powerful algorithm. Not only is it important and uh, really useful, but it's got this neat little trick in it that like, that, that I just like because uh, it's, just a, a, a useful way of approaching problem solving. Like uh, in mathematics, it's not like there's ever one thing that you have to do, right? We're not always expanding and simplifying. Sometimes we factor, like I said, we don't know why, but sometimes we do. Uh, and so we're gonna, you're gonna see this neat little trick that you would say, why would you ever do that? Well, because it's helpful in this situation. Okay, this is a really, this is a really important thing. The nice thing about this, Factoring is like a puzzle. Every question is a bit different. Uh, there's no single like steps that you could write out that would allow you to just factor every question, right? Um, whereas with this, there is a series of steps. Do step one, step two, step three, step four, and so on, and every question will be done. So the first one looks a little bit weird because you don't fully understand why we're doing it and what's gonna happen. But then by like example three, you're doing it yourself and you notice it's the same every time and it's really neat the way it always works out no matter what. Okay, so let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is review a few things. We're not, we're not, the thing we're learning is completing the square, but we're not going to get to that yet. That's on page two. Uh, before I move on, one last thing to say about it is not only do you need to know how to do this skill, completing the square, you want to know it by name and you want to understand what it does. Okay, so we, we need to know what this, in this case, what this skill is for. And in the next unit, it'll be even clearer why would we need this skill versus why would we need factoring when you use one and use the other. That's where we're going with this. But even after today, you will know what completing the square is, how to do it, and why we do it, what it accomplishes. Okay, that's part of what we're learning. Not just how to do it, but what it does. So before we get to that, we're going to review a key skill that's part of completing the square, and that has to do with perfect square trinomials. This is one of the special products that we covered, right? And I told you it's important to see the connection, but you can factor something like this over here. You can factor it like a normal, simple trinomial, that one in that case. So you don't necessarily have to know how to do it, but you do need to have the connection of what a perfect square trinomial is. So let's just review that one last time. If I was gonna expand this, it would look like this, x plus four, x plus four, which equals x times x is x squared, x times four is four x, four times x is four x, add those together, I get eight x, and four times four is 16. That's the expanded version. This is a perfect square trinomial because it came from a squared binomial. It means I can take the square root of it, like a perfect square. Like what's a perfect square? Like 81. You can take the square root and get nine. Same idea. You don't see it the same way, that's fine. But it's the same idea. It's a perfect square trinomial. That's the key trick to today. Somebody tell me, why is it a perfect square trinomial? What makes it? What's the relationship inside? Um, all the, uh, uh, terms? Terms uh, can be divided by themselves. What do you mean by divide? Oh, I see what you mean. Are perfect squares. You can take the square root. Not all of them, but yes, you're on the right track. That is part of it. Yep. What else? What else? What else? Jaden? That's exactly it. That's the connection we're looking for. The square root of the first term, which is just x. Like really, 
we're looking at the coefficients here, okay? We can kind of forget about the x for now, because the x, the x works, we'll take that for granted. So the first term has a 1, so it's 1 times the square root of 16, which is 4. 1 times 4 times 2 is the middle term. Or if I take half of the middle term, so 8 divided by 2 gives me 4, and the square root of 16 also gives me 4, same number, perfect square trinomial. It's important that you see that connection and you understand why that is a perfect square trinomial. So if I look at this one, how can I tell? What's the square root of 25? 5. What's the square root of like 1x squared is just x. And 5 times x times 2. Check. Yes, it matches the middle term. So that's plus and it works out that way. That's the factored form of x squared plus 10x plus 25. Do you agree with that at least somewhat? You kind of understand where I'm going with this, perfect square trinomials. It's a, for us too, we're only really worried about when x squared is 1x squared. That makes it super easy. And that means I'm looking at the, the connection between those two numbers. The square root of this times 2 should give me that. And then it's a perfect square trinomial. So just to kind of summarize again, this is a lot, you don't have to necessarily write this down, but you can if you like. Uh, this is a lot of rewriting the same stuff. The general form, you're, we've done this before, a plus b squared is a squared plus, plus b squared. And what goes in the middle? a times b times 2, or 2ab. What if it's a minus b? I get a squared and I get b squared but I get a times b times 2 in the middle, which is minus 2ab. So that's important when there's a plus here or a minus here. It tells us the sign of that, is that there's like a pattern there, right? They go together. So then again, if I'm going the other way, see what I mean? It's a lot of rewriting the same thing. a squared plus 2ab plus b squared is a plus b, all squared. And this one is a minus b all squared because the first term is a perfect square, the last term is a perfect square, and the middle term is 2 times square root of the first times square root of the second, and then it has the same sign as the middle term. That's the general form with the A's and B's. I know sometimes you guys don't like that stuff. You're like, yeah, okay, whatever. I like it with the numbers instead. That makes more sense to me. That's fine, right? But math people like the general form as well. It's nice to get used to what it means to have 2 times a times b means 2 times the first term times the second term. Okay, so this is not yet completing the square, but this is a little activity that's going to help us put us in the right mind frame to do it. What value of c is required to make each trinomial a perfect square? Find the factor, write the trinomial, then write it in factored form. So, if you understand the connection, and this first one's easy because we kind of already saw an example similar to it. What this is asking is, what, does, what number does C have to be to make the whole trinomial a perfect square trinomial? What if I made it 10? Would that work? The answer is no. What if I made it 20? Would that work? The answer is no. What number, don't shout it out, what number would make it work? Who thinks they know? Pat, what do you think? 16. How'd you get 16? You're right. How'd you get it? Can you? Oh, you just remembered the other one. Good. That's good. That's good. Can we explain how we got 16? Like why that works? Ziggy, what do you think? Yeah, very good. That's right. So 16 is the number that gives it to you. How could you figure it out? Just watch for a minute. 8 divided by 2 gives me 4, and 4 squared gives me the 16. Is that right? So there's like a little mini formula that can actually get you the answer. Take the coefficient of the middle term, divide it by 2, and then square it. And so then I want to rewrite this. Write the trinomial would be x squared plus 8x plus 16. And what is the factored form? That means this thing, x plus 4, all squared.
Okay? You have to get used to finding that number 16, writing it as a trinomial, and then writing it in factored form. That's a big part of this process. That's, that, this is not the algorithm we're learning, but this is the key step. Okay, try the next one. C equals. What would you pick if I called you right now and you had to guess? What would be your guess for C? Liam, what do you think? Five is not quite the C value, but 25, the C, yeah, very good. Why? So ne negative 10 divided by two squared gives me negative five squared, which gives me 25, my value of C. Therefore, X squared minus 10 X plus 25, it's always positive. And how would I write that in factored form? Does anybody know how to do that? Tony? Nice. X minus 5 all squared. You got the minus. That's awesome. Because this was minus up here. It means this was minus. And also, look, if you write it this way, which you don't have to every time, but maybe in your head you're kind of doing that, I've already done the work to find out the factored form. It's right there. Okay, I want you to try this next one on your own. Question C. It's the same thing every time. Remember, there's a little formula. So if you're a little bit stuck, just do it like this, right? So C equals something over 2 all squared. What does that give you? Squared. And then what does that give you? And what is my something in this case? It's 16. So this is an easy question. What's 16 divided by 2? Madison, what's 16 divided by 2? 8. What's 8 squared? That's probably a pretty easy question as well. So there's your number, 64. That's what we were looking for. Therefore, x squared plus 16x plus 64. And how would I write that in the factored form? Remember, it always looks like this. We're designing these to be perfect square trinomials. It's always going to work that it's going to be like x plus or minus something all squared because we made it that way. That's one of the beautiful things about this algorithm is it, it, it never won't work because you design it to work. Okay, And I either take half of that or the square root of that because they're the same thing and put it there. Okay, one more. See, this isn't like factoring. You're not trying to figure out factoring. You're not trying to figure out. It's not a puzzle. You don't have to. You just do it the same way every time. So what is this one? This is negative 34 over 2 all squared, which gives you, is it 289? Is that right? 17 squared. So therefore, it's x uh, minus 34, sorry, x squared minus 34x 
plus 289. And that 17 is the key number here, x minus 17, all squared. What does this mean? It means if I multiplied these brackets out, it would give me back that original thing, right? That's what it means. Um, th that's not the algorithm. That part of it, that's a big part of the thinking. That's not the actual algorithm yet. Any questions about this before we move on? The, the connection between a perfect square trinomial and the factor form and the numbers in a perfect square trinomial is key to this. Well, these questions are not what we're doing, so you can ask that again after we actually do some completing square questions. How's that? This is just a thinking exercise. Now, on the next page, we're going to actually do some completing square. You notice that there's a big thing of steps here. You don't have to write all that down. It'll be up on the classroom. You can write it down later if you want. I do encourage you to maybe bring it up so that you can follow through and remember the steps. It is an algorithm, meaning you do step one, then you do step two, then you do step three, and by the time you get down to step seven, you're done and your question is completed. Okay, and, and so you, ha you follow those steps. Today we're doing simple ones, so that means a couple of the steps we don't really need to worry about. So it's seven, but a couple of the steps are really small, like there's almost nothing to them. And a couple of them today we don't have to worry about. This is actually a fairly easy algorithm, which is, and it has this neat little trick to it, which is one, you know, one of the reasons why it's such a cool thing and it's so powerful. All right, now this should be 12x. Got to fix that, x squared plus 12x minus three. Notice what our instructions tell us. Write each equation in this form. Who recognizes that form and can tell me what it is, what it means, something about it? What is that? Anybody else in here recognize it? Anything? That's what we use to graph so much with. Exactly. It's called vertex form of a quadratic like the parabolas that we were drawing. And this is standard form, right? x squared plus 12x minus 3. That looks like something you might factor, but we're not factoring. Okay? I don't think that one is factorable. Um, but I can't graph it. The question, this one, that, the way it's written, x squared plus 12x uh, minus 3, I can't factor that the way it is. I can factor things like this, or sorry, factor. I can graph things like this, but I can't graph things like that. But if I could put that into vertex form, then I would be able to graph it. And that's what completing the square does. It puts things into vertex form so that you can graph it so that you know where the vertex is. We know a lot about quadratics in that form. So that's what this is all about. Remember I said that was one of the two big things that you're going to take away from today is what this algorithm does. That's what it does. So when, now when you're asked, write each equation in the form, vertex form, I say, how would you do that? You'd say, by completing the square. And then you could go and do it. Right? We, we like to know this algorithm by name. It's helpful. So let's try it. Let's go through these steps. They seem a little weird the first time around. Second time around, they're going to be good. Third time around, you'll do it yourself. Make sure your quadratic is in the correct form. So that's already done for us. That's for, for everything today. You don't have to worry about that. If it's not in standard form, you've got to expand, simplify, whatever, to put it in standard form. Move everything to one side, move the y to the other, that kind of stuff. Group the x terms together. So I'm just going to write brackets around them. I haven't changed anything. I'm just rewriting it. I'm kind of just doing this so that my brain is focusing on the two x terms. That was easy, right? Step two, done. See, seven steps, but the first two were barely anything. Three, common factor of the coefficient, da, da, da. That's for tomorrow. Don't worry about that one. Tomorrow we add that step in, make it a bit more complex. Here we go. Number four is what we were just doing on the last page. Find the value that turns what is inside your brackets into a perfect square trinomial. In other words, your C. Look, it says half the coefficient of the x term and square it. 
So these steps really spell out for you what you need to do. That's why it's a good idea to have them up later. But it's a lot of writing to write it down. So y equals bracket x squared plus 12x. I'm going to leave some space there. What's the number? What's my c in this case? Liam, how'd you get that? Half of 12, which is 6, squared, which is 36. Brilliant. But what do we do with this? Okay, that's step four. We did it. It's 36 in this example, right? 36. Okay, step number five is a little bit weird. Add and subtract this value. So I'm going to go like this. Plus 36 minus 36. Why in the world would you do that? Does anybody have any thoughts on this? Why would you add it and subtract it? Nobody has an idea? Y equals x squared plus 12x minus 3. Okay, so here's this thing, and I'm just going to zoom out. It doesn't really matter exactly what it looks like. There it is. Okay, there's that graph. If I add 36, what's going to happen? Different graph. You're not allowed to change the function. That's what, that's what a relationship is. If you move the graph somewhere, it's a new relationship. It's different. You can't do that. So why when I go plus 36 minus 36, why, why am I allowed to do that? Riley? Why doesn't it change anything? Look at that, nothing changed. It's like adding zero. You're effectively adding zero, which doesn't change it. This is this neat trick that I was talking about. That, so then you're like, well, why in the world would we do that then? Well, we're adding zero in a convenient way that allows us to make this look different without actually changing it. So in the next step, you're going to see what I mean by that, or in the next two steps. But we haven't changed this because we've effectively added zero by adding and subtracting. Neat little trick. It's kind of like when you multiply by one in a convenient way, like a common denominator thing. You're multiplying by one, so you don't change it, but you make it look different, right? Similar to that idea. So watch what happens. So there's step five. Step six, remove the negative value, always the negative one from the bracket minus 36 minus 3 and what do I have left inside the bracket what do we call that that's our perfect square trinomial that we designed so can you write that as a factored form x plus 6 squared minus 39. Hey, that's familiar. By the way, that's step seven, is factor it and add your constants together. You pretty much always get like two constants out here. Not, not always, but usually add them together. So what does this mean? This is a parabola that opens up. Uh, it has a vertex at negative 6, negative 39, and it opens upwards. If you don't remember that over the course of today, try to review that and remember that. The vertex is negative 6, negative 39, opens up. So it has a minimum value at negative 39, and the x value when that happens is negative 6, right? We're just talking about the vertex here. Okay, let's try another one. Yes? Because it's, a, it's an equation. So if there, wasn't, if, it, if there wasn't a y equals, it would just be an expression. It wouldn't be a graph. You could still complete the square. Um, but usually we do it when it's y equals. And if it, like y means there's an x and a y that goes together, that's how we graph. I put in x, I get out y. Does that make sense? Okay, what's my first step? 
y equals, put the x terms together. What's my next step? Find that number that will turn this into a perfect square trinomial. Who's no, who knows what it is? Christian, do you know what the number is that I want to put in the brackets here? Y16. Missing one little step there. Careful. Our brain plays tricks on us sometimes. You're right, 4 squared is 16, Tara. Why do you think it's 4? Yeah, you got to divide by 2 first, right? So just watch that. Good. So I'm going to put that, I'm going to add that. 4 is my number and subtract that. Then move the negative 1 out. Some of you are starting to ask, do we have to write every one of those steps? It's a little bit over the top. Like I could do two of those steps at once. Don't skip steps today. Wait until tomorrow when it gets a little bit harder. Then you can start thinking about skipping steps. And, and you'll see how I write it. And then I would suggest you do it the same and don't try to skip more. But for now, trust me, it's worthwhile to kind of write it out even if it seems like too much. All right, and then what can I do with this? This is x minus 2 all squared minus 3. So again, it's got a vertex of 2, negative 3. Again, it's a minimum because it opens up. It has a shift to the right, 2, and a shift down, 3. No change in the growth pattern. Yes, Leo? Uh, it's possible, yeah. You forget that from the last unit? It'll come back to you. Any questions? Okay, I want you to try this one on your own. have to worry about that now. In the next unit, you'll have to worry about that. Okay. Wait, two questions about this. Is mm -hmm. this like, um, is this like, is it you need it now or you get more skills? No, no. This is the same. Oh, it's added on to more factoring? Yeah. yeah. But can you factor this some other way? It's possible that these could be factorable, but that's not what we're doing. Right now, we're completing the square. Awesome. See, look at that. You guys, you're getting it already. One step you can skip is that first one where you just put the brackets. You don't have to. If you start skipping steps and you start making mistakes, then you know to go back and not skip steps. You're not ready for it. Skipping steps just puts more of the work on your brain it has to think of more things all at once and that's when you start to make mistakes. If you make lots of little mistakes, it will probably help to just write more of the question down. Write things down as you're doing them in your head and you're less likely to make mistakes. Uh, so x squared plus 8x, what's my number that I'm looking for? 16. So I add that. Half of 8 squared, right? Half of 8 is 4. 4 squared is 16. Add that and subtract it. And then the 10 goes outside. Y equals x squared plus 8x plus 16. Look, perfect square trinomial. 
that all, I've said this before, but that always has to be a perfect square trinomial. If it's ever not, you did something wrong. This will always work. And then how do I write the last step? x plus 4 squared minus 6. Make sure you write this part correctly with the squared outside the bracket. Doesn't make any sense to do it the other way. Um, so then again, this has a shift, whoops, to the left 4 and down 6. So somewhere down here opens up. So there's my minimum value of negative 6. And it occurs when x equals negative 4. There's a reason why I keep kind of repeating that. It's going to be useful down the road. The whole point of completing the square is we're looking to graph it, but more importantly, we're looking for the vertex. That's what we're trying to get. Okay, don't write this down, but just watch. I'm going to do one thing. Watch how easy this is. If I have, if I have this function, this relationship, I can't graph that because I don't know enough about it. But watch what I can do. y equals x squared minus 6x. What's my number? Half of 6 squared plus 9 minus 9. And then my plus 5 goes out there. y equals x squared minus 6x plus 9. Bracket minus 9 plus 5. x minus 3 all squared minus 4. So here's your quick review of how to graph these things. One, two, three, and four. There's my vertex, right? Change the sign when it's in the bracket. Keep the sign when it's outside. That's the, this is the horizontal. This is the vertical, okay? Then over one, up one. Over two, up four. Over three, up nine. Hasn't been that long since we've done this. And this asks to find a whole bunch of other stuff, but we're not going to worry about that right now. But look, now I do have the intercepts and this intercept, and I know more about it. But again, the minimum value, it opens up, so it has a minimum. Minimum value is negative 4. That's from the vertex. And it occurs when x equals 3. That's also from the vertex. That's one of the key things that you're supposed to do in the practice today. Write each quadratic form. Uh, what, I'm sorry, write each quadratic in that form, vertex form, and then state the vertex, the range as well. It's kind of the same idea, minimum value and the value of x where it occurs. Okay, any questions?